Right, welcome to another episode of the Tapping Football Podcast. Um, it's your host this week again, Tapping Tobes. I'm joined by two special guests, and I'm also joined by two Ninkum Poops, aka my co-hosts. So, <laughs> thank you for tu- thank you for tuning into this week's um, this week's episode. Uh, I'm going to skip past Dan and Steve, and I'm going to go straight to um, the the gentleman to. To, below me, KG. Um, thank you for coming on today. Um, why don't you tell them a bit about yourself? Hey, man. Nice to get on here, man. I, this is a, one of the go-to football podcasts I listen to, so it's a pleasure to be on. Um, well, I got into podcasting roughly nine months ago, but I also write stuff. I've got, I should have an article coming soon on in the Yorkshire Evening Post, hopefully, so hopefully that gets released soon. But yeah, man, I'm just a, another football voice out here. So, and it's a nice, nice to be out here. Yeah, yeah, it's good to have you on. And um, another gentleman who's joined us today as well, um, joined us again. And we're getting quite popular with The Athletic. I think this is our second or third journalist from The Athletic. So, um, Ryan, thank you for, for, for coming on, mate. Um, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, it's no problem. It's no problem at all. Um, just want to say, obviously, the amount of young black content creators at the moment is fantastic um any chance i get to help any of them out it's uh, it's it's my pleasure um so yeah i've been at the athletic a year now year to the day um so yeah that's been fun uh knew nothing about derby really until i i was given the job and then had my head in books and you know all over the internet doing doing my homework on them got to be prepared um and then this year has been interesting dealing with um, Wayne Rooney, uh, turning up after, like, I think I'd, I'd done one game at that point, and then he turned up the next day. Uh, um, so, yeah, this is my first big gig in, in journalism as well. Um, so I'm very thankful I was I was given, you know, someone took a big leap of faith on me, and I'm just every day, you just try and prove that person right. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's, uh, for me, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a wild ride so far. Good, and long may it continue. Um, we'll probably get into get stuck into Derby a bit more but I think of all seasons to be a to be a, a Derby journalist this has to be like one of the worst seasons ever because it's just been one thing after another this season but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that um, later on during the podcast um, and then obviously Dan and Steve you, you can introduce yourselves now. <laughs> I, 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 think just, I think we just get straight into the straight into the episode. No, now, I've had enough of him. I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually had enough. I've been sitting there waiting for you for 20 odd minutes, and then you come and slander me. You come and slander me, and you won't even let me introduce myself. Yeah, to be honest, I do take I do take umbrage to being called a nincompoop when you're the one who's, who's busy smashing uh, expensive bits of equipment in the week. Like, like. <laughs> Don't worry, man. Accidents happen. Accidents happen. But like you said, then let's actually start getting into the content. So I think this week's. Um, or this this episode is dedicated solely to the championship. So everything championship related, uh, from the relegation battle to the playoffs, um, and then obviously to the promotion hopefuls as well. So I think I wanted to just start off with the actual big news that came that came um, from the EFL probably in the last week or week or so, which is that um, championship football is going to commence from the twentieth of June. And uh, my first question is literally just a, a round the house question. Anyone can answer it. Um, was it the right decision for um, for the twentieth of June to be selected as the date in which the championship clubs come back to play? Yeah, that's, I, that's... I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe it was. Um, if you're if you're a championship club, you would have been prepared, as they knew that the deadline was July thirty first anyway, in order to get something sorted. So the time from between then and July 31st, they should have been ready for all scenarios. So I I agree that we're ready to go from June the 20th, yeah? Yeah, I bet you're nothing to do with the fact that Leeds are, Leeds are sitting pretty at the top and they're, they're a couple games from clinching promotion back into the Premier League. Nothing to do with that, right? <laughs> well, well that's, that, that, that's, that's the thing, though, Toes. In, in our case, it would actually do us a favour to go up via PPG because we go up first, no questions asked. But mm. the, it just seems that there's a willingness in our squad anyway to do it via the games, maybe to put some ghosts from last year to bed. But mm. they seem ready ready to go now. And Calvin Phillips has just come out and said that the team's ready to go. They feel fitter than ever, which is frightening for the rest of the league because we were fit before anyway. 
So mm. for us, this is this is just going to be like cherry on the cake just to get up via the full season being played. I would have taken the PPG though. I'd, I'm I'm not fussy. So the, the break the break I think is actually one of those things that helps Leeds because you saw at the end of last season they they really ran out of steam. Um, yeah, Marcelo Bielsa keeps a, a small squad. That's how he likes it. Um, mm. But the knock on effect of that is 46 games at the intensity that they play at. They they get gassed towards the end of the year. Last year against mm. Wigan was one of the worst performances I've, I've seen from Leeds in quite a while. Um, yeah. So I think this this break. Leeds will be one of the teams that, that really feel the, the benefits of it because they'll feel you know like they've just come off their holidays, nice little pre-season, and you just have to play nine games and away you go. Yeah. Um, I think if it's the right decision, I don't think I'm qualified to say that. I think you put your trust in the governing bodies, those yeah. and the powers that be. If the tests come back and they're low enough or you get zero like in the Premier League, then you can make an educated decision on, yes, it is the right thing for it to return. I will also understand the alternative view of those saying that nope, not for me, because someone, someone in them, them squads, in that coaching staff, in that security staff, in whatever it is, however many people have to be in the building to just make a game of football happen. One of those people might have a loved one with respiratory issues or is in the high um, you know, bracket to to catch COVID. You would understand any one of those people saying, no, I don't think it's the right decision. Um, but I would be lying to you if I said I wasn't glad to have football back. Um, you know, so whether I think it's the right decision or not, I don't think matters. Um, but I am glad to have it back. Perfect. <clears throat> Perfect. Yeah, I think, I think now, well, um, sorry, sorry. I was go just going to say, I think as well, like the fact they are getting tested um, so regularly, and you, I think the last round of tests, and they did over a thousand tests or something, or something like six positive. Um, uh, test results that came back like those numbers and in the Premier League as well over a thousand tests I think they're down to zero positive um, tests there as well so it's like if those numbers stay in and around um, those levels then I don't think you can really be too like annoyed or angry at people trying to you know play the game um, because at the end of the day most of those like on a regular weekend of football most of those clubs would be missing probably more players through uh, you know, hamstring strains or whatever type of other injuries um, that you would have. So I think like as long as, you know, you, uh, as Ryan said, people are making those personal decisions that if, you know, you see what Kante and Joy Dini have done, you know, like, no, I, I don't begrudge them making that decision as well. And as long as people are um, able to make those like decisions based on their own personal circumstances, and I don't see um, anything wrong with coming back. Bro. Okay. Um, I was going to ask another question about the um, decision that <clears throat> the EFL made with with regards to the extension of contracts beyond the 30th of June, but I think we can sort of touch on that um, once we get started. But in fact, you know what, let me actually come back to you, Ryan, because um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Derby have um, a couple of players who are who are um, out of contract uh, at the end of this month as well. So, um, What's the what's the general perception there? Is there an appetite to actually extend all all of the um, all of the would be out of contract players um, beyond the thirtieth of June? Yeah. So as I reported yesterday, yesterday day before, days kind of smash into one at the moment. But as I, I as I reported um, not not long ago, Chris Martin has rejected Derby's first official offer of a contract. Um, now I'm led to believe that there's a willingness from both parties to get this done. Um, however. There are some sticking points, mainly that Martin's contract, the first contract offer um, was 12 months with like an extension that the club could just choose to pick up. So it's not like it was going to be triggered by goals or appearances. You were just going to get to the end of the season and if the club felt like it, they'd pick it up. Um, that really didn't give him the security that he was looking for is what I understand of that. Um, Tom Huddleston, I believe the Derby Telegraph reported that Tom Huddleston has been offered a deal. Um that is again one year deal steep climb down from the from the wages that that he is on martin and huddleston are one of the top earners whatever the deal that gets put to them on the table it's going to be a steep climb down from what they're currently earning um from what i understand this will not be wrapped up very quickly but there is a willingness to get these players under contract um beyond the end of this season and well into well into the next one Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> now, 
let's actually delve straight into sort of the, the playoff picture now because um, Derby are probably, I think Derby are around, what, five points off a playoff spot as well. But currently we have Fulham, Fulham, Brentford, um, Nottingham Forest, uh, Preston, and even the likes of Bristol City as well. Essentially, all of these teams vying for, what is it, four, four spots. Um, what's our what's our view on how this is actually going to um, pan out then? And who, who do we think are, are the most equipped um, to actually um, consolidate their playoff spot once football resumes? You want me to say this or I'll let KG go? It's a round of four questions. He's 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 safe. He knows Leeds are going up. So who who do you want in the Premier League with you? <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I like I like Nottingham Forest's chances. I think they've got a good chance of of get, making the playoffs. Um, but there is a couple of teams outside of the top six that have got a chance of sneaking in. But again, it's that thing of can they jump over the teams that are already in front of them? Um, Bristol City, it, it's touch and go with them. This they're is soft, the problem. Man, with, they're a soft team. That's a soft yeah, Bristol City. Yeah, yeah. Team. The, the problem is with the teams below West Brom and Leeds is that they yeah. they just jump. They just all mix together, man. They jumble up. Yeah. Like they can look amazing one week, and then they'll lose the next. And it's been mm-hmm. like that. We've been the top two for a reason. And even when we was both on our ridiculous slumps, no one could dislodge us from the top two, because no matter what result they got the week before. They were sure to either draw or lose the next week, and that, and that is the that's the difference between West Brom and Leeds, and the rest of the league this season. Um, I like I like uh, as I say, Forest have got a good chance. I wouldn't like to see Millwall get in there, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, what about yeah, um, I, what, what about you, like um, I was gonna ask, obviously go on, Dan. I've got, no, go, on. Go, go go for it. I was I was gonna say um. Just is no one rating Brentford's chances of get of getting up there because I, I've liked the stuff that they've been doing over the past couple of years, like buying players for cheap, you know, building them on them for a couple of years and then selling them um, for for more money. And and they've got quite a few players in that squad that are attracting a lot of interest from um, from the Premier League uh, as well. So I was just thinking it would be quite exciting to see them actually go up and then see what some of those players can do in the Premier League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, well, I, I was going to say, actually, Forrest would be the one that I would think would come up. But I think Brentford, if you look at their squad and the way that they play, they've got a good chance of coming up. Their goalkeeper is very suspect, though, man. And uh, yeah. and he's cost, he's cost them a few points this year. He's, yeah, he's, I've seen he's it. Been, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's worse than, but, he's uh, worse than Casilla. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, Brent, Brentford are good. But I've got, my, I've got my own selfish reasons why I don't want them to go up. So we'll come to that later. Okay. I, yeah, I, I guess we will. I actually, I actually think that the top four, I actually think in terms of playoff spots, you're basically vying for two. Um, and I know Brentford and Forest are on the same amount of points, but I don't really have that much faith in, in Forest. And I think Brentford's um, attack will see them sail into the to the playoffs eventually. But I, I actually think it's, it's basically who can nab Preston's spot or if Preston can keep hold of it. Um, when Preston when Preston came to Pride Park earlier in the season, really wasn't impressed with them at all. Derby should have had four that day, um, but they get they get results. You know they're not they're not there by accident. But I don't think across two legs they would be able to knock off Fulham or or a Brentford. I mean the Forest game if those two met in the playoffs that would be a really tedious game. Um, Bristol for me a, a soft. You score one against Bristol City. I think they can really wobble like that. I mean, they were three 0 up against Derby, and Derby almost got a, a draw out of them. Um, Millwall, they're they're compact. Um, Gary Rowett gets his teams organised, um, and then they they feed off off second balls up top, and that's how that's how they do things. Um, but you know, the, the gap between Preston in six and QPR in 13th is six points. Now, that's mad. And they're not, yeah. not in yeah. nine games. You can make up six points in nine games. You know, mm-hmm. you know it's, it's just two results. Either way, you can make that up in nine games. So it's it's an absolute dogfight. But for me, it's basically four that will go to the playoffs. Forest, mm, um, because I don't have that much faith in them. And then everyone fighting for, for Preston's final spot. Yeah, I think I think the, the championship is like from someone who actually watches so much of the Premier League regularly and then from an outsider looking in, 
in the championship. I know, obviously, you two mentioned the fact that um, Leeds and West Brom, they've been a cut above the rest, but they can still get beat. And that's the, that's the rule of thumb for the championship. Anyone can beat anyone. Anyone can actually beat anyone. I remember I put uh, Nottingham Forest were on a ridiculous streak um, a couple months back and I was watching them and I said, and, I, and they were, I think they were either at home or away to Sheffield Wednesday. I was like, yeah, they're definitely going to win this. And they get, they get hammered, absolutely hammered. Like I think it was like four nil or four one. And I was just thinking that is, that is typical, typical of the championship. And I remember putting money on that game and I lost a lot of money, money in that game because of that same reason as us. But generally, I would be very shocked if um, Fulham and Brentford do not consolidate the third and fourth spot. I actually think Fulham, um, I know obviously Scott Parker is doing a reasonably good job, but when I look at when I look at squad quality in comparison to the rest, we spoke about Brentford, but we should really speak about Fulham as well because I think that they actually have they have a relatively strong squad as well. And they've taken a couple of loans from Premier League sides as well. And some of those players, I know the form has been up or down, but they've actually contributed um, a mean and full amount this season. So I think it would be really disappointing if, if um, Fulham don't consolidate that third spot. And me personally, I can't see Bristol City or Brentford um, breaching. Um, I mean, Bristol City or, or Millwall, sorry, um, breaching that sort of third to sixth um, spot right now. I think how, how, you've got the best striker in the division as well in Alexander Mitrovic. He's, he's yeah. just outstanding. He's outstanding yeah. at this level. I was, I was literally just going to say that that, that guy mm. is, is too good for the championship. Um, yeah. That as long as Fulham have him fit and firing, like you can almost like guarantee that they're going to get goals. Yeah. yeah. On that, um, who who would you yourself say? Because I, I know Toby, we were discussing um, Ben Rama in the in the group chat recently, and you were saying that you thought. Um, in terms of championship prospects, you thought Eze was perhaps top of the list in the championship. Um, mm -hmm. From yourselves, who, who do you guys see as, as, as the one or maybe two outstanding talents in the championship? And then um, I guess who would who would have been your players of the season so far, if that differs from that, that list? Uh, well, for me, yeah, Eze is definitely one that's got to come up to the prem. Like, th th there's no doubt about it. The guy is too good for the championship, especially with all due respect to a club like QPR. He's, he's not going to be able to stay there next season while they're still in the championship. There's no way. Mm -hmm. um, Carl and Grant from Huddersfield should he's probably class. be back up in the Premier League as well. Yeah. Um, and, and the guy for me, as, a, as we talk about Brentford, is Ali Watkins. Now, Ali Watkins can play all across the front and up front. That and the way, and he's improved year after year. He's getting better, and he. If, if Brentford don't come up, he's someone that definitely needs to be taken from the Championship to a Premier League team. Yeah, he recently just did a podcast with um, um. He he was recently on the Counter Attack podcast as well, and he was he was basically saying now that obviously in his younger years when he was coming up, he was playing across across the front three just to sort of get his um, foot in the door but now mm -hmm. he was basically saying that he's proven to everyone else that he's good enough to be trusted to be the regular striker and um, if he was to eventually move on from Brentford um, or even in his current capacity at Brentford that's like his solidified position he wants to be known as a, a striker and, and nothing else and like you said I think his performances this season have warranted that um, he, he looks like a really good talent as well and like Dan said it's another testament to to Bournemouth sort of revolving door um, in terms of getting these players cheap and and then developing them and then selling them for large amounts of money as well. You've, you've, got, you've had Mefham, Tarkovsky. I'm sure there's a few others I, I, I'm missing as well. Yeah, um, I yeah, think more, even... Um, Strike, yeah, Strike more pay. Yeah, yeah, and even... Um, what, what was his name? Moses. Moses of the Badger as well. Before he went to Hull City, he was planning straight at... Uh, um, Brentford too as well. So the uh, the the two centre backs at Sheffield United actually O'Connell and Egan. I think they both came from Brentford too. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. So it's a it will be an interesting one for sure. Um, and I think yeah. I think before we get onto the promoted sides, I think I just wanted us to sort of take a look now at um the bottom of the table as well because I think obviously this one's going to go down to the wire as well. So um. For two clubs in particular, Luton and Barnsley, um, I think our general perception is they're they're as good as gone now. But what 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 um what's what's your understanding of their on, on their chances of actually staying up? I, I think well, I'll, just say, 
Sorry, go on, KG. Sorry, I, I was just going to say, if, if Barnsley on the pitch fight as much as their owners have off the pitch, they've got every chance <laughs> of staying up. They've been, they've, been, they've been coming out swinging, man. It's been good, man. It's been good to see. But, yeah, I mean, their, their gaps and their quality of their squad isn't, it isn't great, unfortunately. Mm. But I, I like the way that their owners have come out and really set, stepped up. And they've stepped up against people like Derby and Sheffield Wednesday for, for reasons. And... Yeah. Um, and they're coming out. Luton, again, I don't think they've got enough. I know they've just appointed their old um, bus back, um, the one that was at Stoke City. Nathan um, and, um, Jones. Yeah, yeah, Nathan yeah. Jones, yeah. And that, and that feels uh, like a move where they're preparing for life back in, in League One. To, to get now. back up, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think I think Luton are gone. I mean, they've conceded seventy-one goals so far this season. I mean, mm. when you and when you don't yeah. score that when you don't score that many, you, you're in real trouble. Barnsley mm. are really are really really strange because they have sort of they have moments where they can keep games really really tight, and that's what they want to do. Um, and in the early part of the season, uh, when they were under new management, they tried to play good football um, whilst also trying to keep it tight at the back, and they just didn't quite get the balance right, and they. They had games where they'd be absolutely treaded and then they'd have games where they could keep it really compact and they're, they're just so unusual. Um, but, they, you know, they've only collected five points from a losing position this year, which means when they go behind, they generally stay behind. Um, and they've dropped 14 from a winning position, which is middle of the pack in the championship. But when you when you don't pick up points from going behind, it magnifies that tenfold and... Yeah, they're, 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 they're an unfortunate and unusual proposition because they, they've lost nine or ten games by a, a single goal this year. And when you're down there, you really, really need to turn them into at least draws, minimum draws, but you really need the, the three points. Yeah. And then uh, I think with those two, if let's just let's just assume that the, that those two that we said are, are, are sort of cut off from the rest. Um, it then leaves one spot, um, one spot left, and then you have effectively probably about five or six teams who are at risk of, of, of relegation from Stoke through to through to Charlton. And um the one player that I wanted to mention from Charlton is is Lyle Taylor because obviously he's been he's been in the press um in recent months obviously stating that he's one of three players who's not gonna who are not going to um play again for Charlton this season because obviously they want to preserve they want to preserve themselves um and um, avoid the risk of injury. Um and a, a player like him in his position as well is that is he doing the right thing there by by um by not playing and um possibly giving uh, Charlton a fighting chance of staying up or um is he is he vindicated in, in in sort of preserving his his body and making sure that he actually gets that that big move that he's looking for because i think he was talking about i think he's been linked with like rangers and I think KG, you were mentioning that Bournemouth apparently have been reported with some sort of interest in in him as well. What's the general yeah, consensus and, there? Yeah, and Palace too. So with, with Lar Taylor, it, it, it's it's weird, isn't it? Because if you're a Charlton supporter, you're looking at it and saying this guy is the guy that can get us out of trouble, and it's true he could, because he's been that guy for them. You know, he's their talisman and everything else like that. But if you're looking at it from Lar Taylor's point of view, now he's thirty now. He's never been higher. This is the the last two years is the best two years he's had. This is his chance to move on now and get the move that he he'll probably never get again. So I I look at it from his point of view. The end of the season before would have been what early May. You if you get any injuries or niggles there, you can you can get rid of those in a couple of months possibly before you due mm-hmm. to take your medical at your new club. He's looking at it now. If I get a twisted knee or whatever and I'm out two to three weeks, I'm not passing no medical. So I can see where he's where he's coming from from a player point of view. Definitely, I I think he's because he, but then then again I can say that because he's not playing for my team. I mean yeah, we exactly. we've got one we yeah we've got one player that's going to be out of contract and if he doesn't decide to sign, it'd be like well okay I can understand why you you're not going to sign. We'll we'll move on. But for when you're down there, and he's the guy to go to because it's not just the goals that he scores. He attracts attention so other players yep. can get free. Whereas if he's not there, it's it's just a regular old championship side again. They're they're in real trouble. They're in real real trouble in all of the games yeah. that Lyle, Lyle Taylor has, has missed so far this season. Charlton yeah. with two of them, and when he scores, they've only lost one game. When he scores, they're they're in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah. they, they don't they don't they don't score a lot of goals right now. 
Um, and the amount mm-hmm. of players they've got out of contract is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I think it's like, what, like 15, 15 yeah. players potentially yeah. out of contract? They've, they've got really? a lot of players out of contract. And some of them are good players. I, I, I did a piece for, yeah. for The Athletic on, uh, I think I picked four or five free transfers that Derby could target. And one of them was the centre-half, Nabi Saar, who yeah. has really yeah. grown on me as I've watched him this season. Um, so... You know, if they if they're gonna go down, if you if you're gonna go down, you can't offer those players new deals because you don't have the finances, especially yeah. in, in a post COVID nineteen world. You just don't have the finances um, to get absolutely nothing for for Taylor. Is in my eyes a huge bit of mismanagement. Yeah, um, it is. I feel I, I feel a bit sorry for them as well because um, last season as well. Um, they sold they sold Carlin Grant to to Huddersfield in January. We all know that he's he's a talented player as well. And then in the summer they sell um Aribo to um to Rangers as well. So um I think they were going into the season having sh- having already sold two of their two of their, their most prized assets as well. So I think it was they started off well, don't get me wrong, they started off well and they won a couple of games. But I think since the turn of the year and especially with that um big um injury that Lau Taylor had during the season as well, they just haven't really been able to to recover, so it will be it will be an interesting one as well. Uh, what about your views on um, Hull City? Because we had we had Kevin Stewart on the podcast a few weeks back as well. They haven't won a game since oh bloody hell, since the the first um, since, the first, day of, yeah. since the first day of twenty twenty. So um, he's back he's back fit now and in training as well. But with them having sold off all their firepower as well, do you think that they um, they could be the ones to sort of drop into that final spot. Yeah, I mean, they're, Steve, they're, going they're also in... Sorry, Steve, go on. Sorry, sorry, no. Ryan. I wasn't saying anything. In, I wasn't going to answer that question. I was... <laughs> 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 He's trying to finish me, mate. I'm not the expert on the championship. <laughs> go on, Ryan, sorry. I was... They, they, between them and, them and Charlton could go either way because, I mean, they sold... Bowen, who, before he left the division, and we were just talking about this a few minutes ago, he would have been my pick for best player in the division, and it probably wouldn't have been that close. Even with Eze, it probably wouldn't have been that close. He was magnificent. He'd play left, he'll play right, he'll play down the middle, he'll go inside, outside. He, he, he was brilliant. Um, but if he didn't score or assist, they picked up eight points, and now he isn't even there. Um, between him and uh, Camille Grisicki, they were directly involved in 33 of Hull's goals. Hull have only scored 49 all season. <laughs> like mm. you, <laughs> you just crazy. you just ripped out all of your point making people and just let them leave. And now mm. the, the team predictably is collapsing. And in some of those games, they've not even been competitive. I mean, you're yeah. getting beat, you're slaughtered, getting beat, slaughtered. Yeah, you're getting beat five one by Brentford at home. Now, mm-hmm. okay, Brentford are a good team, but that's at home. You're getting beat four nil by Leeds at home. Again, Leeds are a good team, but you're getting beat 4-0 by Leeds at home. Even worse than that, you're getting beat Stoke. 5-1 by a bad Stoke team. Now, I'm yeah, sorry to Stoke yeah. fans, listening, but that is a poor yeah. Stoke side. It, is, getting... it really is. Mm-hmm. It really is. Stoke are relegation. By okay, yeah, you're getting beat 3-0 by an OK Blackburn team. You're not even competitive in these games. They're, they're in a lot of bother. Yeah. yeah. Would, you, would, you say, would, would you say that Bowen and Grisicki are bigger misses to hold than Lyle Taylor would be to Charlton. Ooh. Mm. That that's that is a t- I think I'd say so, yeah. I think I'd yes. So. I think just because uh, with all due respect, Charlton have just come up from the championship. They know what life in League One is is about. I think for a team like Hull to then, you know, not long ago, what was it, five years ago, they were contesting the, the FA Cup final with Arsenal. They w- were not long removed from, from being a Premier League team. For them to then drop down mm. again as a direct result of selling your best assets and the financial impact that comes with that. Yeah, I, I, I think I think they're bigger losses than than what, what Taylor would be. They, they got good money for, for Bowen, but, I mean, it has highlighted how one-dimensional the, the team is without him. And, and with, like, with, with Hull's team as well, you look at them, you wouldn't even... There's no way, even if you're blindly looking at just the name Hull's team, that you could even make them favourites for League One next season. Their team is is shocking right now. Mm. Like there's 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 players in there that shouldn't even be playing in the championship, and it, and that's what they replace uh, Grzycki and Bowen with. I, exactly. I said for I, I said a while ago that Bowen should be in the Premier League. I said it ages ago. 
It's just about who's going to take a chance on him. And, and West Ham have, have taken that chance and good on them. But Hull City, what they did is they sold those two thinking that they had enough points in the bank for whatever was happening. They didn't feel they were going to get in the playoffs. They didn't feel they were going to get relegated. But you look at their form, it's red everywhere except for a couple of draws. It's, <laughs> it, it's terrible. I yeah, mean, we, we went there. We went there and it was like a training game. With it. They couldn't touch us. We were just passing the ball at will. They're at our mercy all game. Yeah. Um. Oh, j- looking at the foot of the table. Um. Obviously, you've got, you've got Luton and Charlton and Barnsley. But towards just slightly higher up, you've got teams that in recent years have been like synonymous with the Premier League. Why is it that so many clubs can fall from the Premier League, and then it just seems to be. Um, a never-ending pit of falling. Obviously, we've got Sunderland who are not even in the championship anymore. Um, but it just seems like Hull, for instance, uh, Middlesbrough, Huddersfield Town, Stoke, not too long ago as well, were in the, the Premier League as well. Why Why are they sort of free-falling? What What is it? Because obviously, you do get the parachute payments when you when you drop into the championship, but it, just, it never seems uh, that simple to come straight back up or even come back up at all. Well, I think, well, if I if if I can if I can just go on this one, what mm. you get with with um, you see you see like last season when Fulham, Cardiff, and Huddersfield got relegated, I yeah. never thought about them once as as being championship contenders simply mm. because their teams in the Premier League weren't of championship standard anyway. So when they when when they came <laughs> down, when they came down, I was not worried about them, and I've been proven right. And I also knew that year when Sunderland got relegated that they were going to do the ladder effect and get relegated again. Yeah, they were awful. They, yeah, it's just like you mentioned Stoke there. They've got so many good players on paper, but these are players that probably believe that they should be in the Premier League. So when mm. they're coming down and they, and they see Luton on Saturday and then they see, oh, wait, wait a minute, we've got to go Millwall Tuesday. Ah, oh, I don't fancy this. Mm-hmm. And that's what it is. It's a, diff- it's a different mentality in the Championship. You get five seconds to look around in the Premier League for your pass. Someone's gonna run into you in in five seconds in the championship from behind, probably, yeah. and and they, and it and it takes them out. They don't fancy it, so it, it that does happen a lot. In, in what you've just said there, in teams like Stoke, Middlesbrough, you know, who are always contending before, but as you see, they've had to sell players with FFP. The squads get weaker, and and that's yeah. what happens with a few of these clubs. So would you, that, would you would you say then um, it's because you you sort of talk about like championship squad would you say your squad needs to be adjusted to better fit the the championship and is that more from a, a mental perspective or from an actual um playing style perspective like your physical attributes i mean either of you can answer that i, I would I think definitely it's, say it's a mental thing yeah yeah i was i think i think it's a delicate balance in that because football is built on extremes you know mm. you, you you get promoted you spend all your money like Aston Villa to try and stay in the division. When that doesn't happen and you come down, the the turnaround that you have to then instigate is volatile because you then have to ship out all your big earners for less money than what you paid for them because now they're not worth as much because the buying club is going, what, the guy that just helped you get relegated, what, you want more than what you paid for him? Okay, no thanks. So you have to, you have to then sell and you make losses here and losses there and and you almost have to sort of reconfigure your entire club and then comes sort of this just period of nothing of just existing and i think that's what happens with teams like huddersfield like middlesbrough like hull you you just have to sort of find your equilibrium again and sometimes that means being a little bit irrelevant in the championship again and then build up that entire bit of momentum because you for two years or whatever it is two maybe three years where you were in the championship Premier League, then back down to the championship, your finances have gone one way and then the other. And a lot of clubs spend accordingly with what their finances say. You know, if you win the playoffs and you think, great, we can spend 60, 70, 80 million. Don't worry like that if you go down, as 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 Villa will probably find out. Mm. I think um I think some of these clubs as well, I just I just don't think they've invested well enough. Like I remember when um when Middlesbrough, when Middlesbrough were in the Premier League as well, I think the one thing which everyone knew about Middlesbrough was that they were toothless. They were toothless. Like no matter how much of the ball you give this team, they're not gonna they're they're not gonna breach you. 
And I've watched a few Middlesbrough games this season. They're in they're in that relegation battle as well. I like Woodgate. Obviously, I like Robbie Keane. They got ties to Spurs. But as a team, even when we had them in the FA Cup, despite them having the ball, I wasn't fearful because they were so toothless. They had um, Fletcher, who, um, who used to play for, I think he used to play for Sunderland, and he used to play for West Ham as well. Don't get me wrong. I like his approach play, but he's not a goal threat. This mm. season as well, they've scored something like what 30, 39 goals in the league. I think they're, they're like the lowest scorers in in the championship or something like that. And yeah. it, I, I just think, I just think for me that screams, that screams um, poor investment in your team. Yeah, you see Middlesbrough as well. They they were never high goal scorers anyway. But what they had was a, a great defensive structure, and they had Randolph in goal as well who was one of the best keepers in this league for a couple of years as well. Mm. So they and they've they've lost that. They they don't have him no more. Um there's there's also teams that like you said that go up. They don't spend the money when they're in the Premier League, but they get relegated and all of a sudden they're opening the checkbook. Obviously yeah. that's reduced now with FFP, but I've seen it so many times. They don't buy the players when they're in the Premier League. They they wait until they get relegated. They start spending the money again. And it, it's just weird really one. weird. It's yeah. a weird one. I think um, before we actually touch on the um, promotion hopefuls, then I think Ryan, I think this that sort of thing about FFP that actually sort of brings us nicely to to Derby <laughs> now. No, no, no okay. what? What? <laughs> I didn't. <What? laughs> it's because uh, obviously you um, you were charged you were charged with um, breaching. I wasn't, um, I, I wasn't charged with anything. <laughs> <Yeah, the> club, <laughs> the, club that, the club that you that's poor journalism, Toby. <laughs> The club that you represent, or the club that you write your articles about, he doesn't even represent them. <laughs> Listen, as far as I'm concerned, he I'm is the Derby. Derby. No, he, he's Ryan, a Derby you correspondent. Make a statement because he's trying to pin something on you. <laughs> but, I give, it, I, give my time. Time. I give up my time on this Sunday, and you put it. <laughs> so, um, free information on me. <laughs> You're going to be in handcuffs on your birthday tomorrow. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Back, back to the matter at hand. So back on um, the 17th of January, Derby were charged with um, a breach of the, the spending rules. And then when I actually, I remember I, I read about this at the time. And when I when I read about what they've been accused of, it it, it was literally like a mini version of like Man City with the, with the Yeti had deal as well. And then because the the owner he they sold their stadium to try and generate more funds. They sold the stadium to the owner who then bought it for much more than what it's worth. And then I'm just thinking, um, what's happened with that? What's happened with that charge? And um, um, what could be the possible outcome? Because I heard that there could be a possible points deduction as well. And if that's the case, would that possibly come into effect this season? What, what What's the general um, status of, of that charge? Yeah. Um, so for those that, that don't know, Derby were charged um, for breaching FFP rules. Part of that was the owner, Mel Morris, sold Pride Park to one of his companies, which he owns, so essentially to himself, uh, for £80 million. Um, I believe it was valued three years earlier at about £40 million. Yeah, uh, that allowed them that allowed them to show a pre-tax profit of fourteen million pounds in their books. Um, they were also warned about their player amortization policy, which is basically you have a player, you sign him thirty million um, on a three-year contract. Each year of that contract, he loses ten million. Um, that's how usual amortization works. Derby definitely weren't doing that and were making it up as they sort of went along. And it makes it really hard to track in your books once you. Mm. Um, you know, once you try and sort of submit your your accounts for, for FFP. So, yeah, that's what they were, in a nutshell, being charged on. Um, Derby are adamant that the EFL ratified the stadium sale. So as far as they're concerned, this is a nonsense and they will be found innocent. The EFL are under enormous pressure um, to get this done this season. Um, as my colleagues Nancy Frostick and Matt Slater reported, um, teams are threatening. Teams in the championship are threatening to sue the EFL if Birmingham, Sheffield Wednesday, and Derby are not punished this season. My understanding is that Derby are expecting their punishment next season. So there's there's a disconnect somewhere, um, and I'm not sure why that disconnect is there because, uh, as I said, there is pressure to get this done this year. I'm not sure what the punishment is. 
or will or will be, or even if there will be one, Derby remain adamant that they are innocent and will be found innocent um, at their hearing. Um, the harshest punishment possible is 21 points. That is technically possible. I don't think it would come to that. I think if they were to get a points deduction, you're looking at something like six to nine. Um, but even even that, if they were to get dropped nine points, you know, they're suddenly finding themselves uh, scrapping a little bit in a in a bit of a relegation dogfight. Um, and of course, a, a hefty mm. fine would a hefty fine would hurt them a lot. Um, you know, because in a world with with no football for three months, and you're you know, Derby are paying one point one million a year rent on their own stadium. So when yeah. you're doing that and don't have any football to supplement your income. A hefty mm. fine really, really damages you. Um, okay. So, you'd, yeah, they're, they're, in a, they're in a bit of trouble with that. You'd think that if they sold it to their owner, he could pause those rent payments for, for three months. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll give himself mates rates or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, they're, they're in a bit of a sticky situation then because the next question was obviously going to be a bit of – was going to be a bit of bait. Like, what do you rate their, their playoff chances? But <laughs> – I think, <laughs> all, 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 all I think the big game, the bottlers are not making it this 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 time around, are they? <laughs> all, all things let's 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 say for for argument's sake, they they get punished next year. Let's just say they they start next year with I don't know minus six points. Um, their playoff chances are still alive, but they've got a murderous row of fixtures coming up. I mean. You know, they, they got Millwall away when football returns. They follow that up with Redden at home. But then after that, I mean, seven of their nine remaining games are against teams above them. And, and I think that's where you want to be if you're making a run. You want to be reeling teams in above you and, and the cliched mm. six-pointer. Um, but then after that, I mean, they've got a run of Forest at home. Again, with no fans, that's going to be really weird. West Brom away and then Brentford at home. I mean, that. Those three games are, are huge. And for me, they, they need seven points um, to even be in with a shout of making the playoffs because their last three, Cardiff away, Leeds at home, Birmingham away, they're okay. I mean, Leeds, Leeds could be home and hose by that game, which means mentally mm. maybe maybe you switch off a, a little bit. So all things being equal right now, the playoff hopes are, are well intact. Um, but the big problem has been stacking wins. Um, they just don't do it enough and haven't done it enough all season. I think they've got back-to-back -back wins once this season, which is an issue. Um, but when they're good, they're really good. But they, they have a self-destruct button that they can't help but press <laughs> some sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and it, and, and they, it, usually, they, they usually press it. Sorry, they usually press yeah. it during the playoff season. So, yeah, yeah, the yeah, playoff yeah. period, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, obviously, we, 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 like, we last year were... I think I think Lampard got his team selection wrong, and obviously was it 2014 when Bobby Zamora scored after a sort of botched Richard Keogh would be clearance. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've they've had problems at this end of the of the season. Uh, yeah, the the, the Derby thing is interesting though because they they've been doing this for years. It seems like they've been overspending for years, and yeah. Steve Gibson of Middlesbrough finally came out and says, "I want to see their books." You know, he actually came out and said, "I want to see Derby County's books." Because they, they've been they've been given big play, contracts for players in the championship for years. This is nothing recent. They had Bradley Johnson there for a, a few years. They had Chris Martin and all these other expensive strikers up there, and they've never they've not even been up back into the Premier League that recently. So it was it was bound to catch up with them eventually. All, all of this FFP stuff, whether they're guilty or not, I, I, we'll see. But. The, I mean, I mean even, even the root, even, million, even the root. as well. Like, Kachanya has not played a first team game in two years, and they spent four million pounds on him. And they got the the defender say. from Arsenal for it in a ten million deal. Is it Christian Bielik? Christian, Christian Bielik, Yeah, that was that was this that was this summer, um, and that's mm. one of those that we talked about before. Where it's it's ten million. It'll be passed out through yeah. various years of his contract on various avenues. Mm. Um, and I believe it's, I think it's seven and a half initially, which can rise to 10 on incentives. Um, so it's still a lot. Don't get me wrong. That is still a lot of money in the championship. But yeah. 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 What about, um, I wanted to, because I wanted to ask about um, the, obviously the situation that happened um, in October last year as well, because I, I remember reading an article um, 
probably like I think it was like two or three months ago where Richard Keogh was invited by Sky Sports to to cover um to cover a championship match and Derby basically vetoed his appearance on Sky Sports because they, they didn't want him doing any sort of like public appearances. And for me, that sort of struck a chord because I feel like whilst what he did was reckless and whilst you could probably argue that he he did deserve a second, it's just weird that the the two sort of younger and more um more sort of useful players that weren't at the end of their careers were were kept on were kept on at Derby and then he was sort of ruthlessly um, sacked even though he had 15 15 months in his contract so um what's the sort of PR um uh, what's the sort of PR perspective at, at Derby with regards to that decision then because I thought I, I personally felt like he was dealt a bad hand but yeah um on on the on the Sky Sports thing my understanding was that the club simply reminded Keo and of what he can and can't talk about um with regards to a case which is still to this day ongoing his appeal is still ongoing mm. um that was my that was my understanding of 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 that that could be an incorrect understanding but that was my understanding of 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 the situation um in terms of his contract being terminated but Tom Lawrence's and Mason Bennett's not. Um, I I can I can see arguments for for both sides of this. The argument of well, these guys have got resale value. We're not sacking those guys. Football, you know, a football club will take them. Millwall proved that they would take Mason Bennett, albeit on loan, but a club still proved that they would take that player. Um, and you look at it and think, well, if, if Richard's going to be out for 12 months and he's only got 15 left on his contract, he made the decision to get into the car. Um, yeah, it's you can see why someone would 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 make the decision to sack him. You can see why someone would very rightly say, excuse me, should you not get rid of all three? Um, yeah. Richard, Richard Keogh was the only person on that night that didn't commit a crime, a, you know, a criminal offence. You know, Tom Lawrence and Mason Bennett, those gentlemen, they were charged found guilty um and also you know as we heard at the court hearing a failure to stop at the scene they left and didn't return for richard for nearly an hour um the only way richard was keo was tended to was by chance an ambulance drove by that's incredibly lucky um he could have yeah. died um you know it, it so yeah I, I understand that the club really had to wrestle with its pr image for 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 a good long while and you could argue actually has not recovered fully from that. Um, as I understand it, the appeal is still ongoing. Ongoing, As I understand it, there are incentives in Richard Keogh's contract that mean if Derby do go up, um, should Keogh win that appeal, he would be entitled to more money, um, which is a bit of a, again, a, not a sticking point, but a sort of you wait and see what happens and, and so on and, and so forth. Um, Keo was offered a deal to stick around. It was a deal that he he didn't think was fair and rejected it. And then the club sacked him. Um, it was it, it was a brutal brutal handling of of things. Very, very. I brutal. I personally have remained well away from giving a personal opinion on it, and I'm going to do so um, because I just don't I just don't think it really matters what I what I think about it. I, I understand both sides of it. Um, mm. And I understand both people shouting in both directions of it. I honestly don't think it matters what I think about it. Yeah. Well, see, you you picked the right year to cover Derby because usually <laughs> before it was lead, it, it was it was Leeds that we was doing all the headlines and giving national press their 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 column inches. But Derby this year, I think somebody replied under a Derby County club statement one time. Uh, club statements four away wins three or something <laughs> like that. So D D Derby have been doing some business this year. There's, yeah, a, there's, yeah. a running, there's a running joke that Derby are, are also corner flag FC because they just always have the, the corner flag statement, the stock image when they have to mm -hmm. run. <laughs> um, so yeah. and the one time the one time they didn't do that was when um, when we were in lockdown and they provided an, an EFL update and someone underneath said, "Has the corner flag been furloughed?" And I was like, "Oh man." <laughs> <laughs> But you say, oh, hey, but you say that as well. Mason Bennett has done well. He he's made a, a personal joke. A personal joke went public, didn't it? When they when he drove past Pride Park. Yeah, that was yeah. So he, so he, he drove, just another he another past, thing. He drove past Pride Park 
um, which is an issue. It has never been proven he was driving that car, um, but it is obviously an issue if he if he was because he was banned from driving for eight, uh, for eighteen months, I believe it was. Um, so yeah, and then screaming effing burn at Pride Park. Um, I mean, he's he, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The That's less said, it, the yeah. better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Be better than that. Be better than that. And and the and the, the problem I have with his apology is that he didn't apologize for doing it. Um because if you knew it was wrong, you just wouldn't have done it. Um but he apologized for causing offense and it was meant to be a private joke and stuff like that never washes with me because it's always you you're not sorry that you did it, you're sorry you got caught. Yeah. Um because if you knew it was wrong, you just wouldn't have done it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think um, that's enough about the sort of mid-table, mid-table clubs <laughs> in the championship. <laughs> yes, I call Derby a mid-table club. Um, let's actually focus on the two teams in particular that, um, by all accounts, look like they're actually going to be issuing for um, Premier League promotion this year. So, KG, obviously, I'm going to start with your um, beloved Leeds United. It's been a long time coming for Leeds in terms yeah. of actually um getting back to the Premier League but I think this actually might be the year where you like actually do it um where do you rank um Bielsa amongst the current pr- crop of Premier League managers now and how do you think Leeds will fare um if they are promoted yeah I mean if we go up well when we go up and Bielsa <laughs> is there right I- I've got no again this is this is me looking at the Premier League and and I've got it's so average, man. Like, that bottom half of the table, I'm not worried about at all. Like, any of those teams, I would put our current team up against those those bottom of the league teams, and I wouldn't even be nervous. I'm not saying we win every game, but I'm saying I've got no fear of them. Mm. If he goes up, he's going to be one of the best coaches in the league, and it's that simple, because we shouldn't even be having him at, in the championship. And when we lost last, when we last, when we lost last year in the semifinals, the one thing that I was just hoping for out of everything is that we get to keep Bielsa. If we keep Bielsa, we can go again. Without him, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a very, very tough season. Yeah. And with that, the players that have... Because we've pretty much got the same team bar a couple of additions. It's a second year under his methods. It's yeah. a second year under his guidance. And he is... What he's done with the team is amazing. Because a lot of these players, if, if people remember a, a few years ago, we're finishing like 14th, 15th, and it and going nowhere, absolutely nowhere. But he's he's got the best out of these players to where now we've got Jack Harrison back on loan from Man City, and he's one that gets unsung, unfortunately, because his goals and assists aren't as high as they should be, but that's because we haven't got a, an actual bagsman up front to finish mm-hmm. the chances that he puts in. Exactly. Um, and, and that was yeah. gonna be that was gonna be one of my because you were mentioning that you were mentioning that a lot of these a lot of these players, a lot of these teams are average, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, in the bottom half. But some of those bottom half sides like Crystal Palace, for all the fancy football you play, you go to you go to um what's their stadium? Sellers Park, and you might become unstuck. And I'm sorry if you have if you have Jason Jason Pantsford up top, yeah. It's <laughs> Patrick 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 sorry <laughs> Patrick Bamford you know you know my you know my feelings of him I, I saw him at I remember I remember when he was at I think it was at Derby and I, I didn't I didn't rate him then he went to then he and he said that he could have a crack at um making it into the Chelsea first team I laughed it off went to Middlesbrough poor and then he signed for Leeds and whenever I watch him all energy, no output. So my thing, my thing with Leeds is all this fancy footwork you play. We've seen many a side come up to this league, play their fancy football, and and are unable to stick the ball in the back of the net. Yeah, I, was well, that, say, like, I, I think though, that is a, a a big a big area of the pitch that you'll need to improve on if you do want to stay up. Because I do rate Bielsa very very highly. Like I think we can all, Steve, you probably remember when his mid, uh, athletic, uh, athletic side absolutely oh, yeah. dismantled yeah. Alex in. Sorry. In, yeah. in in uh, <laughs> in Europa back then, um, fantastic. Lorente uh, special. You know, you know, Pep and all of these other managers. They all go are uh, Bielsa's massive influence on on their management styles. They've all gone to learn under him and this, that, and the other. And I think even thinking back to the was it the FA Cup or the League Cup where we played you. Um, I think it was the first round of the FA Cup, the third round of the FA, FA Cup. Cup. Yeah, uh, I was at that match and I was really, really impressed with the way you know that you you literally played us off the park for that first half. 
But not hard. at the end of the day, Patrick Pansford, is that what we're calling him? Um, or oh, Jason. Jason, <laughs> whoever. He's come way down now, hasn't he? <laughs> he? He was actually, for me, he was the difference on the day that if you had a better strike, mm. if you had probably Nketiah playing, um, for you, that uh, in in that match, I think you would have you would have um, you would have battered us in that first half. And then, so I think when you do come up to the Premier League, like I'm looking at the table now, you got the likes of Watford down there, you got West Ham, um, even Norwich. I would say in Team Puki, they've got a quality, they've got better strikers and better you know players up top than what Leeds have. So I think, and and they've also struggled. So I think you will need to improve and get someone that can get you ten to fifteen goals. Otherwise, you will find it hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, with that, with the strikers, um, we've got Augustin on loan from Leipzig mm. at the minute. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen him play properly yet, but he's looking in shape now. He looks he looks Bielsa fit now, so Bielsa might be ready to play him. Because even when we sign players, if they're not in Bielsa shape, they don't play. They don't. So yeah. whereas, you, where you, whereas other teams will sign players and all of a sudden they get a start or they're on the bench, we might not see our new signing for three, four weeks until mm. they're up to Bielsa speed. Now, if if we do keep Bamford, which in all likelihood we might do, because Bielsa, I, I guess someone some would say he's got a fault of being too loyal. But if we do if we do keep Bamford, if we keep him in a, an attacking midfield position, doing what he does, I would accept that because he does he does a lot of the things really well in terms of build up play, running the channels. He's almost like a, a Shane Long, if you will. Oh God. <laughs> And don't you criticize Shane Long all the time? Aren't you the one? I, I do. No, no, no. Listen, I do. I do because he's a, he's an actual striker, and as, as is Bamford at the minute. But if you want to move Bamford back and then put an actual person that can get the goals in, I, I would accept that. But if if he's going to be our main man, of course I'd be worried about that. Of course I'd be worried if Patrick Bamford is our our main striker next year. But I'm waiting to see also what Augustine's about as well. And I, and I guess we'll and we we'll, and I think we'll get to see him in the next nine games. I, yeah. I have concerns um, if Leeds went up, as, as you do with any team from the championship that moves up. Um, I don't think tactically that Bielsa is that flexible. They play one way and it's been enough to beat a lot of championship sides. Um, the intensity is different. Now, OK, you play less games, you play 38 instead of 46, but the, the trade-off is the intensity is absolutely massive. Um can a Bielsa team press the way they want to press for 38 Premier League games? Not so sure. Um, does he have a plan B in his locker for when things aren't going right? Not so sure. Um, we saw between December and was it about February, you know, beat by Wigan, you know, had a really, really, you know, drew with Preston North End, beat by Sheffield Wednesday, beat by QPR, close run thing against Millwall, beat by Forest, drew with Brentford. I mean, you know, they're, t- they're top of the division. Um, almost because West Brom was so inept at the same time that they just refused to leapfrog them. Um, but let's let's make no mistake here that that team has still put up some real wobbly performances. Um, yeah. I, I'd have you need a better goalkeeper. Bailey Peacock Farrell last year wasn't doing it, and then uh, Kiko Casilla came in and He's somehow awful. managed to be to He's be awful. even more un- unsure. Uh, <laughs> you, you need you need a better goalkeeper. You need someone outside of Hernandez who can really unlock a defense. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you'd have enough to stay up, but I'd, I'd have some, I'd have some real question marks. Well, I was going to well, mention what, on on Fernandez as well, though, because Fernandez is what like thirty, what is it like 30, 33, 34? Um, 34, yeah, yeah, thirty four, yeah, coming up to the Premier League, and he's still, for me personally, he's still widely regarded as one of your most sort of like creative outlets. So, in addition to um, the striker as a as a sort of specialist position, I think along the word, along Dan's point, you're just going to need more firepower altogether in 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 those in those positions. And I also yeah, think yeah. as well, um, and we and it's not just applicable for Leeds; it's applicable for West Brom as well. I know it's easier said than done when these teams get promoted and they say we're not selling our best players. But um, are you going to be able to keep? Um, keep hold of the likes of, let's say, Calvin Phillips or Luke Aylin, or if it's West Brom, are you going to be able to keep a hold of the likes of um, Ferguson, um, Pereira, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, Ferguson is a tricky it, one because he's out of contract at the end of the year and it looked exactly. like he was going to, to Palace. So, like, they could lose him for nothing. Like, this exactly. bright young, you know, um, fullback, they could just lose him for zip. 
he he's been good as well, man. He's been so good this year, Ferguson for for West Brom. He can play right full back or centre back. He's been he's been terrific for them. But going mm. going on what um what Toby just said in terms of Calvin Phillips, if we if we don't go up, then it would be wrong to expect Calvin Phillips to stay another year because he he deserves to be in the prem. I've I've said to you, Toby, on on Twitter many times, I I rate him higher than Rice and your beloved Winks. He's got more to his game <laughs> than them two. Players. Let's say beloved. Right. Come on, I like I like okay. Harry Winks, but I don't, I, I think he's a a basic player. Yeah, he's very basic, man. Yeah, and and it would be wrong to it would be wrong to expect him to stay. So I would I wouldn't say that he'd stay. If we go up, I, I don't see why we'd why he'd want to go. He's a Leeds guy, I, and that, and that doesn't mean everything. But you can tell that if if he really wanted to go, he could have done it this season. You know, there was offers for him this season to go up to the Premier League, and he said no. I'll I'll stick another year, and and that's a that's a, a point for for Ryan as well. And in terms of the Bielsa intensity and everything else like that we're doing this over 46 games where we're playing saturday tuesday and you know sky messes us about all the time sometimes we're playing sunday tuesday in the premier league next season we're just going to be one another team that has got a saturday to saturday schedule part a few midweek mm. games so there's more recovery time for the players there's mm. more time to to learn about the next opponent that we're going to have which he's meticulous with anyway bielsa so I, I think that's going to be one of the advantages, actually. Less games, more time to plan. Um, additions additions are needed. And, and the problem that we've got is, like I said, we've got Bielsa, who's loyal, but we've got fans that are a bit attached to a few players. But it's the same thing as if Calvin Phillips, if we don't go up, Calvin Phillips should go. We shouldn't expect to go up and, and expect to keep players that aren't going to be good enough for the next level too. So it works both ways. Yeah, um, just um, on to West Brom as well. Obviously, Billich has done a really good job with with West Brom this season. Um, obviously, they're, they're odds on to, to get uh, promoted back into the big time too. But um, similar to our worries about how um, Leeds might have to add some additional firepower, um, I personally think the same can be said of West Brom. I know they've plundered goals in, in, um, in the championship, but I mean... You're relying on a 31-year-old Hal Robson Carnu, who's having his probably his best ever season in his professional career, and he's got something like 10 goals. 10 goals in the championship, your best ever season. 31 years old, coming up to the Premier League, and then you've also got Charlie Austin, who went to Southampton, um, couldn't really cut it out of Southampton, and he's aged over the years as well. I just think, as good as these teams are in in the championship, I think both sides will need. Um, a considerable amount of investment. And I'm not saying Aston Villa type where you need to go out and spend 142 million on, but I just think it just needs to be smart, smart recruitment in, in some of these key areas as well. Yeah, it's, I would. It, I was just going to say, it's, it's a tough one though, because like, if you actually look at the Premier League now, the quality that some of these teams in the bottom half actually have is is really really impressive. So like just looking at the bottom half of the table, you know, like Bournemouth have got a lot of good players. They're currently 18th in the Premier League. Watford, West Ham, Brighton, Southampton, Newcastle, you know, all the way up to Crystal Palace, who are 11 and Everton in 12. Like you've got hundreds of millions of pounds invested in all of these squads. So like when you are West Brom, you're coming up. Your best player is Hal Robson Carnu. We've seen Hal Robson Carnu try and play in the Premier League when he's in his prime. Uh, like age 20, 25, 26, 27, and he couldn't cut it then. And then you're expecting him to come up as a 31, 32-year-old and, and lead your line. It's really difficult to actually come up and, and not spend money, as we've seen in Norwich, who haven't spent, who spent barely, basically barely a penny uh, in the summer, and they're really paying for it, trying to play Premier League football with the same style with, with basically championship players. So I think if those teams do come up, they are going to have to spend money maybe not as you said in the way that Aston Villa have by 11 players but maybe bring in four or five that you know are prem prem standard you know and that can really make, make a big difference it's going to yeah, be that's when your mismanagement of Nathan Ferguson comes in you could have used that money yeah. you got like 20 million for him or 15 million for him whatever you could have used that to mm. add some additions yeah, is that like, yeah wouldn't he wouldn't he um sorry go on Steve I was going to say it's going to be interesting to see how they map out their transfer business, obviously, given the financial constraints 
who they're actually going to be able to afford and what kind of quality teams are going to be bringing in. I think the bottom of the table next season might be quite substantial. Like we might have a lot of teams in and around the bottom area because the quality um, is is all going to be at a similar level. It's just going to be seeing who actually finds the, the sort of uh, diamond in the dirt. Well, I think West Brom, speaking of diamond in the dirt, they found one in in Pereira because um, I can't remember. I'm not sure if who who it was that wrote the article on Pereira from the Athletic Ryan um, a few months back. What and they were basically badly. Yeah, I think they were basically talking about um, his impact on on West Brom this season and their chances of of, of keeping him um, next season as well. So he's one who they probably need to hang on to as well. And then even Dean Garner as well. Whenever I've watched him for West Brom this season, he's looked. He's like he's not been ahead. He's not been like he's not been leaps and bounds better than everyone else. But he's been someone who sort of stood out for me as well. So they have some of these lone players who have done relatively well for them this season. That they have the small matter of having to sort of retain them on a permanent basis next season or a loan or a loan basis next season as well, and still also supplement the squad to get it to Premier League standard. So it's going to be, I think. I think they're probably in a worse off. Me personally, I think they're in a worse off position than, than Leeds in terms of coming up and adapting to the Premier League. I think also for them, yeah. you look at someone like Pereira, um, even even if you manage to retain his services, you're going to need a lot more. Um, you look at someone like Buendia at, at Norwich, who treaded the championship last season, eight mm-hmm. goals, 12 assists. This year, he's still got seven assists, but five of those, five of, four of those came in the first five games. And you got a pair of them in the the three-two win over Man City, and he's not scored this season. The, the step right. up for a creative player like that is huge because you're operating in tighter spaces with you know these midfielders, you, you know Angolo Conte and Scott McTominay and and all, and all these players that occupy those same areas you want to be in, and they're better players than what you were used to being up against in the Championship. You've also got centre halves who don't mind stepping up and meeting you in midfield and will will nip the ball off you in double quick time. They don't mind that. So you're operating in pockets of spaces now where the quality of player is, is through the roof. Um, so you, it, it's going to be tough, even if they keep hold of, of Pereira, who's, I think he's got eight, eight, goals this, eight goals this year. Even if they keep hold of someone like him, um, they're going to need someone who defenders can go, oh, hang on, we need, we need attention over there. And then you just create that little bit of space that a player like that needs. And I think Norwich have got that with, with Pucky and Campwell and, and players like that. And I think West Brom need more of that in their team if they are to, to go up and make a real fist of it. Yeah, because even, even, like... um, even, even someone like Grzycki as well, I mean, we saw what he did before with Hull. It wasn't that yeah. much. He's older yeah. now. He's one of those where they've bought him just to solidify the top two and then see what happens exactly. next year. It, they need to replace him too. Yeah. And they only bought him in. They only bought him in, in January as well. I was going to talk about their uh, before I wanted to end the podcast. I was going to talk about their defense as well because obviously that that Nathan Ferguson situation is 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 quite key. Um, essentially, losing one of your um, losing one of your best players. Um, I think it will probably go to a tribunal. How old is he again? I think he's like twenty. I can't remember how old he is. He like twenty, twenty, twenty-one. Yeah. Um, it's going to go to a tribunal. So either way, they're going to end up getting less money than they would have had he not been um, on the last, uh, had his contract not expired as well. And I also wanted to mention, um, what's that fella's name? The Nigerian who plays for them as well. Um, Ajayi. Every time um, I watch him, yeah, yeah. yeah, he seems, he's like a man mountain. He seems to be scoring as well. And I always look at him and I'm thinking, this is someone who I, I think maybe he might have a lot of Premier League eyes on him as well. So in addition to retaining some of the players they have on loan, keeping some of your better players who you have on a permanent basis from some of these sort of so-called Premier League vultures now, it's a it's a difficult sort of juggling act for them to to to, to face as well. And Slavin Bilic, he seems to have shaken off the rust he had at West Brom. I mean, West Ham, sorry. But um, remains to be seen how he's going to fare um, when it, if and when they actually get promoted um, next season as well, so it's a it's a it's an interesting one for sh- for for sure. It's well, well that, that's one. the that, that's the thing with like West Brom as you mentioned there, and that's why I don't have that much worry when it comes to Leeds in that in that sense because it, a sleeping giant is the term that's overused, but we are 
and all we've been missing is the Premier League football. No much. We've got a we, oh, we're there, we're there. we've got a top we've got a top class coach as well that people. You ain't been in the Premier League for fifteen years, man. Oh. <laughs> sleeping, sleeping Giants been in a coma. Yeah. Man, like, <laughs> it's been for a minute. Isn't it? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? No, but listen, yeah. When when we do come up, right? We got we've got one of the best coaches in the league. Right, we got one of the best coaches that's not known worldwide that players love to play for, that want to play for. We're a big, we're one club city, and and people know of Leeds United, whether we've been a joke or not the last sixteen years, and 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 that has been the case. People do still remember very vaguely now as the memory is getting you know further and further away. They are remembering that Leeds used to be a, a solid club, and that's and that's where I think we've got the difference. And also, our players in general are younger anyway. We've got Jack Harrison that could. Signing with us permanently for around eight million as well. Coming up, we've got Helda Custer on the other wing, who's who's a ready-made Premier League player too. Um, we've got. Um, I, I'd, we've got... I'd, I'd, I'd like to disagree oh, on that. To be honest. Come on, man! <laughs> <laughs> you tried to well, sneak that one in. <laughs> no, 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 no. And also, we we got we got Mateusz Klich in there, who's a full Polish international, still with the Poland team, and he's he's yeah. ready to step up. He's another midfielder that is easily Premier League ready too. Um, Luke Ayling as well, solid right back. We've got like we've that. got positions where we we've got players that are, are I believe are ready to step up. It, it it's then the the cover and also getting some new players in that are ready for the Premier League. Because as much as I love the team that's going to be coming up, not all of them are going to be good enough for the Premier League, and they they have to do something about that. This section was about and, that, and, and oh. yeah, well, well, listen, yeah. And, and that, <laughs> But that, that's what I was saying about Brentford. You know, I said that I oh, don't want Brentford to come up because I would love us to take someone like Ollie Watkins off their hands because he would he's, he he's would be perfect. Set you back twenty million though, he's going to Ollie Watkins will set you back twenty million. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Well, that, that's that, that, that's what it takes. I mean, if McBurney costs twenty million from Swansea for Sheffield United, <laughs> you've got to think Watkins is going to cost a, a bit, probably around the same or a little bit more. But he he's worth he's worth that risk definitely. My concern with West Brom is that that team is old. That team is yeah. exactly old, aging, man. Old. Like you mm. mentioned, how Robson Carno at, at, at thirty-one. I mean, just looking at their squad: Charlie Austin's thirty, Austin. Matt, Matt Phillips twenty-nine, um, Jake as you mentioned, yeah, thirty-one. Jake Livermore Barry. twenty-nine. Gareth yeah. Barry one hundred and sixty-four. Um, <laughs> even even Kieran, even Kieran Gibbs, who you always assume yeah, he's aging. The lad from the, the the kid from Arsenal, even he is now thirty, um, and yeah. you know it's, it's it's a really really old team. That, so whatever happens, if they go up, if they even if they don't go up, that squad's got to get younger. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, I think I think that's pretty much it for us. Then um, it's been a very enjoyable podcast. A lot of Leeds propaganda thrown about. Um, <laughs> a lot of shots at Derby. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a massive Leeds fan. Like, I love Leeds, man. I've been dying for them to get back into the Prem for. Oh, really? You love Leeds? You, you realise Leeds are supposed to be one of your biggest yeah, Man United rivals. Uh, yeah, listen, listen. Let's put name, that all name their first three albums then. <laughs> I don't <laughs> name their first three albums. You love Leeds so much. <laughs> no, no, I don't know. <laughs> How, how, old, how old were you when they were when they were last in the Premier League? You must have been spitting oh, dummies out still. Oh, like 13. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I was I was I was rooting for them in that Champions League with the with Kuhl and Viduka. Yeah, they had they had gems, man. They had gems. Yeah, yeah, man. They had they had ballers. Um, so I'll be, I'll be I'll be excited to see them step back into the Premier League. Obviously, I do like them because they're no longer a competition for Man United. You know what I mean? So that's. I don't uh, really think they were ever competition for Man United. To be honest, they, they had a couple we of seasons. We were, yeah, we was once. They were, yeah. Yeah, so uh, very, we... very vague, very light competition. No, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it was yeah. very light. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shameless. Shameless. <laughs> but guys, um... <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you for, um, thank you for both coming on. Uh, Ryan, where, where can they, where can they find you? Um, I ain't, I ain't telling you my address. No, I'm just, I'm just, uh, if if you're on Twitter and you would like to have a conversation, I'm at RJ Conway ninety two. Okay, brilliant. And KG, where can they find yeah. you and your leads? Yeah, at, your leads essays. I'm a, I'm just at KG underscore on Twitter, and that's where you can find me for everything. 
Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, well, guys, thank you both. Thank you both for coming on. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, for those who are still listening or watching, uh, make sure to follow us on Tapping Football as well. And we'll be back with another episode you, uh, sometime in the near future. Before you Go close on. up, I'll just say another personal thanks to Ryan and KG for enduring Dan's horrific outfit for over an hour. <laughs> 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 and I'm dying to go. So you lot must be crying as well. So. <laughs> it doesn't even. It doesn't even match as well. It's like yeah, different shades it's of not, green. It's not <laughs> right, man. I'm just covering the lack of trim. That's it. You yeah, got, that's like, what this is for too. Yeah, yeah really, you got to mix it up, man. I can't have people think I've been wearing the same hat for 13 weeks, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, uh, I... <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, thank you for listening, and um, we'll be back soon. Take care.